How you doing, Greg? Doing great, Peter. Really happy to be here. Well, we're really happy to have you on the show. Appreciate you coming in for this. Thanks. Um, came as a big recommendation to us. Somebody was well, like, "Hope I don't disappoint." Uh, I don't think you're going to. Okay. And uh, as you know, about two hours ago, we uh, changed what we want to talk to you about. Okay. We had all our research and work done, uh-huh. and then uh, Danny just was reading something and found this article you'd written behind the veil mm-hmm. uh, about to uh, how you can have more of an objective evaluation of Bitcoin. Yeah. And uh, we both read it and were laughing, uh, <laughs> amazed, and just like blown away and said, no, we've got to change this because this is what we've got to cover today. So I, th- I think before we start, though, uh, people might not know who you are. So sure. it'd be good if you can introduce yourself, explain who you are, your involvement in Bitcoin, and what you've been doing with the resistance money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, I came in to Bitcoin in, um, like on my own privately in early 2018. I was looking back at my um, Coinbase transactions to see, you know, when I bought, I bought Bitcoin and a little Ethereum at the same time. Is that allowed? To, am I allowed to say, allowed that? To say yeah, that? I don't have any Ethereum anymore. But, uh, early seventeen, um, early eighteen. Oh, early eighteen. And, and and so I I I bought it literally on the Ethereum top. And so what was that about two hundred thirty dollars? Uh, it was like thirteen hundred or something. Oh, that high. This is yeah. This is like the first couple of weeks of 2018 as things were going down. Oh yeah. And so I was one of these um, casualties that you often hear about yeah. that um, they buy the, they buy the top and then hold all the way down and then become like a battle-hardened hodler. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was uh, around uh, the spring of 2018 that I, after, after I was, I just had a little bit of Bitcoin, I would like to investigate it a little more deeply. And I, I read around and read the white paper and it blew me away. So I thought, well, this um, is something worth devoting my research time to. So I started writing and publishing papers, um, academic papers about Bitcoin because I'm a I'm a philosophy professor at um, Northern Illinois University based out of DeKalb, Illinois, the birthplace of industrial barbed wire. Okay. Yeah. Right. And uh, so I've been I've been uh, writing ever since. And actually, by the time this episode comes out, I'll probably have tenure, so I can really let it fly today. Okay. Uh, um, you can fucking let rip, man. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but not long after, I was. I was presenting uh, one of these papers of mine. Uh, this one is called "What Is Bitcoin?" Uh, in Pittsburgh, and Bradley Rettler was in the audience. He was yep. there for the same conference. Great guy. He's awesome, and um, he was like, "I didn't know that you you had an interest in Bitcoin." And I said, "Do you? You know?" <laughs> and um, and so we talked about Bitcoin all weekend, and I'd already reconnected with Andrew Bailey. Yeah, he was a philosopher at Yale and US, and uh, I knew that he had an interest in, 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 interest in Bitcoin um, going way back. And so, um, soon after, especially after COVID hit, um, we all agreed to start collaborating. And we have a website now called Resistance Money, where we um, deposit all of our, you know, our podcast interviews, our blog posts, our academic articles. And I think we have a pretty good trail of proof of work now, and we're writing a book together. Okay. Yeah. What's the book? Can you say anything? Yeah, the book is called um, Resistance Money. Great. And we have a book contract with an academic press, um, Rutledge. Um, They've been supportive, and we're going to be writing it for the rest of the year. And hopefully soon after, it won't be too long that we'll have a physical book that we can give people. We'll have to get you on the show and talk about the book. Uh, yeah, I would love that, it's, it, um, especially Andrew and Brad. Well, neither of them have been on the show. I think we've yeah. Andrew booked, right? Andrew's going to come on next time we're in the US, I think. Okay, so nice. and I've spoken to yeah. Brad as well. Yeah, yeah. definitely want Brad. Brad's. I've only had. I don't know if I've met him in person, but we've we've had interactions online. I think Brad's great. I'd love to get him on the show. They're so good, and um, they are very clear communicators. They're honest about Bitcoin's trade offs, and they're just really smart. I mean, I think what, what a lot of people don't know. Um, and I'm talking about Andrew and Brad and Troy Cross. Yeah. Um, these are legitimate academics who were um, well respected in their fields. I mean, the odd thing is that we're all we, we've all worked in the same like little subfield of philosophy. It's kind of an interesting coincidence. Um, but 
um, they're, they're very good and they're going to continue to do really good work for Bitcoin. One interesting trivia uh-huh. about Troy Cross. Yeah, shoot. So uh, I teach at Northern Illinois. Uh-huh. Um, we have a terminal master's program. It's a kind of a springboard uh, for people to go into um, top ranked PhD programs in philosophy. Um, I was a student in this in my very program. So a lot of my current colleagues were my teachers at one point. Um, but when I was a student, um, I really looked up to Troy because he, uh, he also went to NIU and did the terminal master's program um, and did really well. So I was like, I want to do as well as Troy. Okay. And so if you would have told me then that um, I would, years later, <laughs> be on a Bitcoin podcast <laughs> talking about Troy's <laughs> um, incredible contributions to Bitcoin, I would have just been so confused. You know, what happened? Yeah, but dude, if you'd have said to me five years ago that uh, in uh, in four years' time you're going to be running a podcast and interviewing the president of a country, I'd have been like, "What the yes. fuck are you on about?" Yeah, I'm, right. a, I'm a degenerate. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, so like uh, we talked about this the other day, and that um, the 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 Bitcoin but- butterfly effect is quite strange. Yes, it's uh, yeah. We st- not only we're still early on price, but we're still early in people establish themselves as their role they play in the Bitcoin space. Yeah. And uh, the number of opportunities available for people brave enough to go out there and right. start talking about this while it's not uh, mainstream popular yet uh, is massive. And C- Troy was great. I mean, we mm-hmm. had, when we had Troy in the show well, was in San Francisco a few months ago, he was new to me and it was mm-hmm. such a great conversation. And since then, he's just flying. He's just yeah. off. Yeah. And uh, I, think it, I think this new wave of... Uh, philosophers coming in and talking about Bitcoin is is super useful because yeah. there are big ideas that people are wrestling with. Uh, one of the things that stood out most from your th- paper that we read today, which uh, we will share in the show notes, was uh, where you talked about not only do the detractors uh, have a bias, mm-hmm. but the promoters also have a bias. Sure. And that's a super yeah. important area we're going to get into. And uh, I really like this because I like I... I don't want to just be a promoter of Bitcoin. Right. Sometimes I wrestle with this. <clears throat> yeah. uh, my uh, owning Bitcoin, having a platform which promotes Bitcoin, yeah. but also this feeling I need to have detractors on and challenge because we need to be, be fair. And I also have these mild worries about the unknown second and third order effects of yeah. Bitcoin, especially if it continues to rapidly remonetize the world. Sure. There are... Uh, various theories and what that means for the nation state, etc. And some ideas are good, and some well, some ideas are positive, but there are also some ideas that might have a negative. And we don't know. Yeah. And uh, I feel like a sense of responsibility for that. So when we were reading through your paper, I was like, ah, okay, this is a conversation we we have to fucking have. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll get into it. Yeah, let's have it. We obviously uh, in this new interest in Bitcoin. Well, one of the fascinating things is watching the. Yeah, the the attacks that come in it, whether it's from uh, the mainstream media or politicians or detractors, yeah. there's there's a lot of people who seem to want to attack Bitcoin, and the lens of why they attack Bitcoin is, is super interesting. Is yeah. you know, and I I've rethought about it literally in the last couple of hours after reading your paper, and I don't want to con- explain my conclusion till later on, mm-hmm. but it certainly made a lot more sense after you'd written what you'd written. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, us as Bitcoiners, we're used to these attacks, people coming and attacking Bitcoin. I don't know if we've always got the best form of defense. I, sometimes we do. I think, for example, I just read a paper today hmm. that was uh, Alan Farrington, Nick Carter, along with Ross Stevens from NIDIC. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's a good piece of work. Yeah. And there's lots of good pieces of work coming out like that. When we see detractors on Twitter and people dogpiling, I sometimes feel like, mm, I mean, which I've been part of. Yeah. Uh, is that the right thing? What I think you've come out with is this framework. So, do you want to give the background to why you, you know, why you built this framework? Oh, sure. That might be a long story. Tell it. Okay, so we got time. <clears throat> I created this meme a while back. <laughs> it's a ladder, and um, on one end, it's um, it's high prestige, but low information. On the other side of the bladder, the better side, it's low prestige, 
high Bitcoin information. Um, and I think there are causal relationships between the, the two things on each end. So on the, on the high prestige side, people with high prestige, I think they have trouble putting themselves in the shoes of people who are less well off. And also, they continue to associate Bitcoin with um, political views, the political views and behavior of certain kinds of Bitcoiners. And so it puts them off. So Bitcoin has a bit of a stink on it, honestly. Is that the libertarian side? Yeah, the liber- like the, anar- the anarchist, libertarian, um, FU sort of, you know, Bitcoin side. I, I think of it as like the more like Ted Kaczynski side of, of Bitcoin. Um, and then on the, the other end of the ladder, there's the, the low prestige. And, um, and that's because I think that uh, there, there are two kinds of low prestige people that are interested in Bitcoin. One, one kind are the, the people who would just have never have an opportunity to get the prestige, you know. So um, and that's not a bad thing. I, like prestige is a, a neutral, amoral thing. Um, but they get Bitcoin a lot more quickly. And then they learn a lot more than the high prestige people do. And then um, in addition, you have people who maybe once had prestige and they just don't care about it anymore. And that's one of the reasons why they're apt to get Bitcoin. And they're willing to give it, give the prestige up um, for Bitcoin. And, and I'm, I'm closer to that camp. When, when I started writing about Bitcoin, like in 2018, I, was, I, I, I really didn't care so much whether that would burn some bridges. Um, the reputational risk um, was worth it to me um, because I think Bitcoin's good. And so um, I wanted to, to write a piece where we could um, help the people um, on the high prestige side, low information side, um, help, help put them in the shoes of the people that are less well off. And then secondly, I was, um, I've been increasingly inspired by the cypherpunks in the 90s and what they went through. Um, and I increasingly see, um, I, I, yeah, I just draw in, uh, inspiration not only from what they did, but how they did it. And so, um, so this is the long story. <laughs> okay, all right. So um, It's a long form podcast. It, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, you make my job easier. Okay, okay. So let, let's start back in, in the 50s then. Um, so Truman created the NSA. And it was a, it was a, who who did? Uh, Harry Truman, is that president? Why, is that why the Truman Show was called the Truman Show? Is that like an Easter that's egg? A, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not sure, but it was a it was a secret organization. I mean, yeah. um, people didn't really know it existed twenty years. Uh, people called it the No Such Agency. Um, but they finally they finally came out of the woodwork when academic crypt- cryptographers. Um, started to publish research, especially on public key cryptography. So this is like um, Diffie Hellman stuff. So it, so initially, um, the way that the government would try to tamp down on cryptography, um, would, would they they would look for academics and they'd uh, they'd say like you don't want to publish that, okay? And in fact, don't come work for us. We'll use your a- academic research to actually make the country better and safer. And so a lot of people did that. And um, public key cryptography had already been invented by a British guy, James Ellis, yeah. um, years before. And so, um, but Diffie and Hellman, they, they kind of released this um, animal out into the wild and it changed the world. And You know Diffie's been on the show. I have. I, I've listened to it. Yeah, that's yeah, great. He's yeah. one of the most fascinating people I've interviewed. What a legend! I know, unbelievable. I yeah. Was, sometimes you do an interview, you feel like, God, I am so lucky to be sat with you right yeah. now. Yeah. What's, what's really interesting? So, um, th- there's this book called Crypto by Stephen Levy. I don't know if you've read it. No. But it's interesting because it was published in 2001, and uh, the author didn't have the benefit of Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. You know, and so the way he writes about the cryptographers and the cypherpunks, it's like. It's this pre-Bitcoin perspective that's so invaluable. Mm. Um, so you you you, um, you get this perspective on uh, these academics and um, activists that isn't tainted by you know the later price appreciation of Bitcoin and its success. But 
Um, but then, you know, the government, um, as the government was unable to just use this kind of soft coercion to prevent cryptography from being released out in the wild. And so they increasingly relied on more draconian measures. And um, by uh, 91, um, the <laughs> there's this um, Senate bill called 266. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the middle of the night, the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee changed the text in the bill. And it sounds familiar. It's like all the same mm-hmm. stuff that we're going through. Exactly. Um, changed stuff. the text in the bill so that um, like people who are producing communications protocols or equipment for communication protocols, they'd have to be able to offer the government um, the unencrypted like plain text on request. And what that means is that this isn't a private at all because the the companies themselves would have to have would, would have to have a, a trap door, a back door. Mm. Um, and and so um, oh, oh wait. Guess who that was? The head of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Tell me. Um, the gentleman from Delaware, uh, President Joseph R. Biden. I was about to say Biden. Yeah, yeah, right. I was like, who's old enough? Yeah. Well, it's Trump, but he wasn't in politics. No. There's only Biden left. Yeah, so it's Biden. Probably <laughs> good intentions, but um, but enemy of the people at, at, the, at the same time. And he did it at the request of the FBI. And so this is often how it happens. I think that politicians, like, they are, they have good intentions, but they really don't know what they're doing. Mm. And um, and soon after, soon after that, uh, there was the, um, the clipper chip, um, which, which gave the government the back door, which is even worse. Yep. <laughs> and so, um, so how did this, how did the cypher punks respond? Well, they responded by making memes, honestly. Mm-hmm. They made stickers that said like big brother inside, like a riff on the Intel motto, um, Intel inside. They, um, uh, Phil Zimmerman rushed out uh, PGP, pretty good privacy, like mm-hmm. a, a private message protocol, um, and 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 uh, eventually um, John Gilmore made the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So they so they, they like made their own institutions. They memed um, and they they built. Really, I think really we could boil down the response to two things: they built and they taught. Um, Cypherpunk's white code. Yeah, yeah. They write code and then they educate. Yeah, and um, and 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 they did that um, in response to this this unrelenting um, government pressure to dampen the strength of cryptography. Um, the government also tried um, to dampen the spread, so you can dampen the strength and also dampen the spread. So. Um, one, so you can either weaken cryptography or you can try to um, confine it. And so the, the way that the government tried to confine cryptography is um, via the international um, arms and um, trade regulation code, um, where um, the government sought to control the import and export of um, cryptographic or privacy devices and so what this meant is that um, cryptography, like public key cryptography, count as a kind of like, like war instrument. <laughs> and, and so the, the cypherpunks, uh, they did two things in response to, to this kind of um, attempt, which I, which I really respect and I, I find um, kind of hilarious. One is that um, uh, cypherpunk Phil Karn made the laws look silly. So um, there's this book called Applied Cryptography. It was published in 1994 by a guy named uh, Bruce Schneier or something. Actually, he he signed this anti-crypto letter. (laughs) He's just like, why is your name on there? (laughs) Anyway, um, uh, this letter that was recently signed also by people like Stephen Deal and Nicholas Weaver, you know, like prominent no-coiners. The twenty six. Yes, yeah, or 25 now. 25 Yeah. Um, Why, who pulled out? I think Kelsey Hightower might have pulled out. Okay. Or so I'm told in response to um, some persuasive argumentation by Alice Gladstein. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. persuasive and diplomatic. I think we can say it because it's going to happen soon. 
you can't tell anyone, but there is yeah. a, or you might even know yeah. that the cat, you know. Yeah. So hopefully by the time this yeah. comes out, otherwise uh, it'd have to be edited out. We're having the counter letter. Yeah. There's a, there's going to be a, a very effective counter letter. A reaction. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what Phil Karn did is that he, um, he showed that the law forbade exporting the book in digital form because it had a bunch of, you know, cryptographic algorithms. So the law forbade the, the um, exporting the book to other countries in digital form, but he was allowed to ship it overseas in physical form. It's like, what gives, right? Yeah. Um, and so with efforts like this, the cypherpunks really, I think, captured the public imagination in order to show that um, some of these laws and some of the ways that government tries to impinge on our civil liberties, it's just silly. Uh-huh. Um, one of the other things that happened around this time is that um, the government, um, instead of just like, like b- banning the export of uh, cryptography, they said, okay, you can, and, these, and they did this to like companies like Microsoft and Netscape. They said, okay, you, <clears throat> you can allow people overseas to use cryptography, but it has to be super weak. Okay. Um, and so they allowed people to use like um, keys that consist of like 40 bits or something. Um, which now it's trivial to break. Then it was less so, but but still pretty trivial. And so... Um, so what's the fucking point? Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> and and, and the, the cypherpunks um, really did this neat thing. So um, Tim May uh, emailed people on the on the mailing list and say, let's, let's crack it, okay? <laughs> let's crack it and show people how silly this is. Um, and then added back, replied and said... I, I've already started, okay? Um, and so what they did is that they um, they took the, like the trillion or so possibilities and and uh, apportioned it out so that people could search. You know, like, like it's like the digital version of um, in the physical world looking for a child. You know, you portion up the, f- the space and say, okay, you search that way, I'll go this way. Um, so that's what they did. It didn't work for Microsoft because it was a like, technical form of formality. Um, so, but they, they, not too long after, they shifted their attention to Netscape, and then they cracked it. Um, the, the message they cracked was written by one Hal Finney. Okay? Um, and so you see like a lot of the same people that were later yeah. involved with Bitcoin were involved in this thing. And think about what they, I mean, this is kind of an aside, but think about what they just, just did there. It was kind of group crypt- cryptanalysis. They, um, together in a kind of decentralized network um, by trial and error, try to find a solution to a mathematical puzzle that is relatively hard to find, but easy to verify. What does that sound like to you? Uh, that's, repeat that last bit. It, it's, it, it's the it's puzzle. Mining. It's mine. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's, it's so, um, so you can't tell me, that this kind of successful effort to embarrass the export law didn't have some sort of inspiration for Bitcoin mining. Right. Um, um, the only, huh. like one of the only differences is that they were trying to crack the private key, whereas in Bitcoin mining, um, you're trying to solve for like um, a hash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're a little bit different. Hash is like a, like a one-way mathematical Humpty Dumpty. Like, um, so you're just trying to... Yeah, no, no. What, where, where my head is at, I'm like, I'm getting lost thinking. Huh. Yeah. But so in this process, did they inadvertently discover some of the clues for creating Bitcoin? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Um, uh, but in, in all of this, they were doing two things: they were building, and then they were teaching. And so the way that I draw inspiration from the way that they dealt with these kind of unrelenting attempts from the government to in Pinch on civil liberties is um, well. I, I I don't really have the skills to build, but I can teach, right? Um, and and so um, what I would like to do then is write papers that can help people think through what Bitcoin is, what it's not, what the trade offs are, and at least why I overall think it's good. Okay. And and this also motivates my um, involvement in the Bitcoin Policy Institute. Mm-hmm. So this is the newly founded organization that's, it's not 
an advo- advocacy group. It's education. It's an education group. Yeah. Um, and that's needed because there's so much misinformation. And there's so much misinformation, I think, because um, either there are people who want Bitcoin to fail. Well, that would be disinformation. D- disinformation, sure, yeah. Um, or there are people who just don't know enough yet. Um, S- sometimes so, uninformed, yes. sometimes malignant. Yeah, I think that's right. And so, so this Bitcoin Behind the Veil paper is an effort to try to reach the people who are not malicious. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a way... Because the malicious people will stay malicious. The, the malicious people will stay malicious. I think that they're probably lost cause. I mean, I'm the sort of person who holds out hope even for Judas, you know? Like maybe Judas will someday um, repent um, but, but you're referring to Elizabeth Warren here. No, no, I, I'm actually referring to <laughs> the real historical first century Palestinian Jew. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I thought you meant Elizabeth yeah, yeah. Warren. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if I'm holding out hope for Judas, I'll hold out hope for Elizabeth Warren. I mean, is, is that um, like how strongly? Well, not very strongly. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, I think there's hope for everyone, but I. I'm not going to count on it. And so I'm going to focus my efforts. I think the, effort, the, the efforts are best placed on the not yet totally informed people. Who could be misled. Who could be misled. Easily. And you, Easily. And you see that. I mean, I saw Especially it. when the high prestige. Yeah. Group. So I saw that recently on Twitter. I mean, I see, see it a lot. Like there was a thing yesterday. I put a tweet out and uh, somebody agreed with me. Someone disagreed. And someone said, oh, he's got Bitcoin in his profile. Ignore him. It's yeah. just one of those things already. Yeah. Or you see the uh, people repeating the same stuff that you see in the mainstream media, and you're like, you just don't know yet. Yeah, You've got no reason to get, be against this, but it goes back to what happened in your paper, is those who trust or want to be liked by those who misinform yeah. will repeat what they say. Yeah, and, and this is really important. There's a lot of social pressure to be against Bitcoin. Um, and I don't know if, um, so my, my brother is also an academic philosopher. Okay. Um, he's written this great paper, not paper, a book. Uh, there, there's also a paper, but the, really um, what people should read is a book. It's called Moral Grandstanding. And so much of it applies to, to um, both p- people outside of the Bitcoin community and people inside it. And so um, Moral Grandstanding is the, is, um, is the, the way that we, try to appear morally respectable to other people. So if, like, if you're around other people who are like bashing um, conservatives, you know, like, oh, yes, they're so, they're like cavemen, you know, they yeah. have backwards values. Um, and then like you're sitting there, like, and you could like be like in the in-group and get points, like social points yeah. for joining in the condemnation. So that's moral grandstanding. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the way that we, um, try to appear morally respectable to the people that we respect. And, and the, so there are pressures, um, especially among the elites. So academics, people in the media, regulators, lawmakers. All the people who spread shit. All the people who spread this mis- <laughs> mis- and disinformation. Yeah. Um, there are social incentives to be anti-Bitcoin. Um, and then, I mean, but to be fair... There are also social incentives within Bitcoin to say, in my opinion, a bunch of less um, compelling things. So Bitcoiners try to win approval from other Bitcoiners. Yeah. You know? And so we have these, like, we have this kind of, um, so we'll pile on, uh-huh. you know, we'll pile on people on Twitter, um, like what, hap- what has happened with some people that we know. Who they face the Bitcoin mob? Yeah, um, the ever watching eye of yes. the Bitcoin yeah. mob as well. Yeah, so there, there's like there are like pressures for purity. Like, yeah, I've only ever held Bitcoin, or I only hold Bitcoin, or you know, um, and so, uh, so yeah. So which I, by the way, I think yeah. it is bad for Bitcoin. For yes, two reasons. Yeah. The first reason is I think you sh- we should be able to test our ideas. Yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure every Bitcoiner believes in free speech, so let's use speech to test our ideas. Mm-hmm. And secondly, I just think it's a bad look from the outside. It is a bad look. I mean, this goes back to 
um, uh, what I said about Ted Kaczynski earlier. I mean, what is a more compelling version of a Bitcoiner? Like what would make you hold want, want to um, be not anti-Bitcoin? If Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people guy, yeah, yeah. you know, was going around talking about Bitcoin or if Ted Kaczynski. <laughs> because this, I mean, this is often what happens. People send these tweet bombs. Uh, I'm guilty too. I mean, I've done a bunch of tweet bombs. Um, some of them kind of funny. Um, uh, but yeah, this happens. So the, there are both social pressures um, for anti-Bitcoiners or non-Bitcoiners to be anti-Bitcoin. And there are also social pressures within Bitcoin to be virently pro-Bitcoin. Uh-huh. Um, and so th- we should be mindful of those things just as we should be mindful of um, the cognitive biases we have. Um, but it's not just social pressures. Right. It's economic incentives as well. That's right. That's where yeah. the cognitive biases come in because right. um, you, like everyone wants to pump their own backs, right? I mean, I think deep down, um, this, or at least this is a- Or protect their bags. Or protect. So, so this is a tendency, we should say. It yeah. doesn't need to be activated, but it's there. And it's something that everyone has to be watchful of. So here's, here's the thing. Um, um, I'm writing this paper with Will Luther. Um, it's kind of like the part two of the paper that we'll talk about. Okay. Uh, but uh, it's- Who's Will? Will Luther. Um, he's an economist- He's uh, an economist for the Bitcoin Policy Institute. You should have him on. Is he he's, on our radar? Uh, he's not really, no. Where's he based? Um, Florida. You huh. get a good oh, trip on this. Thing. We're going we're gonna to be there soon. Mm-hmm. There you go. There's another one. Yeah, he's great. We're going to have everyone from the BPI. Soon. I hope so. Where's your brother based? My brother? Yeah. Um, Bowling Green, Ohio. Okay. He's awesome. It, like, he has a, a bunch of very good podcasts I think you'd enjoy you, you could talk, you like, if you ask him, how does this apply to Bitcoin? Boom. Two is he, hours. Is he into Bitcoin? He's supportive of me. Okay. So, so he knows, he knows stuff about Bitcoin, but he's not like really active on Bitcoin Twitter or anything. Yeah. Cause we were, we're always looking for new and interesting people to talk to yeah. who haven't been on the Bitcoin podcast because there's like 7,000 Bitcoin podcasts now yeah. all recycling the same guests and topics. So to get yeah. new and interesting people, we'll, we'll put them on the list. Yeah, I think you'd have fun with him. He's 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 a much better speaker and I think probably a better philosopher than I am. Um, and a really good Why don't we get him this time? <laughs> <laughs> you got the wrong warm key. Uh, but I, I think you're, I think you're but just anyways, being humble. Yeah. Okay. This, um, this, uh, so this is relevant. So um, imagine, so we all agree that people who hold an asset should disclose that they hold it when they write an article about it in the media. Yeah. Why? Well, because we think that holding the asset might um, lead you to be unduly positive about it. And so readers deserve to know that you hold an asset when you write about it. When I'm... Um, and now that I'm affiliated with the Bitcoin Policy Institute, I also write for Atomic Finance. Um, I have like the I've signed like conflict disclosure forms with my university. Like I have to disclose those things, and that's good. That's a that's the right thing to do, to disclose um, these things because they're they're signs that I might be cognitively biased. Mm-hmm. Now, what about people who were knowledgeable about computer science and economics, who heard about Bitcoin, wrote an anti-Bitcoin essay in like 2010 or 11, and they've been anti-Bitcoin since. They're, they're not holding an asset per se, but they're holding opportunity costs. Mm-hmm. Sometimes orders of magnitude more than like what any of us would hold in Bitcoin. Yeah, And so why is it that it's good for us to disclose and they get off the hook. So like, like take Paul Krugman, Mm -hmm. first anti Bitcoin blog post in like 2011 or something. If he had put $500 in Bitcoin at the time he wrote the article, multiple, multiple millions. Yeah. Okay. So shouldn't readers know that the opportunity cost for him has been many millions of dollars. I think readers should know. 
And so, um, same for Schiff, same for Nathaniel same Popper, for all same these, for all these people. Yeah. The, same for all these people. Um, so, and, and you notice over time their uh, their articles or their attacks seem to become more cynical, yeah, uh, and more salty. Yes, um, there's a kind of snark that I find off putting, uh, even though I, I mean I do some of this myself. Of course, but, we're all hypocrites. But, yeah, <laughs> we're all hypocrites. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think readers should be mindful of this kind of cognitive bias. Um, and uh, are are those are, are are people who have these huge op- opportunity costs going to be convinced by anything I write? Well, probably not. No, no. So we yeah. forget them. We discard them. Yeah. So we forget them, and then we can give Bitcoin behind the veil to someone else. Right. So we discard those with the cognitive bias and we discard, uh, discard those with the potential massive uh, downside from Bitcoin adoption. They're yeah. the two yeah. groups we discard. Yeah. Yeah. Because what, what came out of this for me, I am kind of moving forward to the conclusion, but it's fine, I think, yeah. is that what came out of this for me is that we should, by the way, and this highlighted every decision in society for me, but we should consider the net impact for all yeah. when making these decisions. Mm-hmm. But what ends up happening is the majority of the decision power and influence comes from a very small group of people. Absolutely. And they have a ripple effect to others. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, right. So, so democracy is very skewed. Yeah. Um, the people who don't have power don't have the opportunity to enact their vision of what reality should be. Yes. So that's, yeah, very much so. Or they have limited scope. Yes. Limited yeah. scope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So how, how if we want to evaluate Bitcoin as objective, yeah. objectively as possible, how do we come over, overcome okay. our bias? Okay, so let's get to it. Yeah, let's okay. get in. So... Um, we we all agree that everyone on any side is li- liable or subject to cognitive bias. Um, and the cognitive bias often comes from self-interest. And so the, the shtick is to try to divorce yourself from your self-interest. And the idea is that um, you can imagine a situation. So this is a thought experiment where um, you've taken a pill that has erased temporarily all your personal memories. So you don't know who you are. You don't know um, whether you're male or female. You don't know the, whether you're rich or poor, where you live. There's just no personal facts that you remember. But you do have your wits about you, and you have at your disposal you know, all this information and statistics about um, payment networks and how money works. Um, um, banking, inflation, and all this. All right. And then someone, you know, um, wakes you up in, in, dar- in the dark so you can't, like, see your own skin and says, hello, you've taken this pill, um, and uh, we have a choice for you. And the choice is whether or not you'd like one of these two worlds to be actual. And you don't know which one is actual. You don't know which one's the real world. Um, and but you think that you like it's now your responsibility to make one or the other one actual. So what are these two worlds? Um, one world is is our world. It's the actual world. You just don't know it behind this veil. And then the the other world is one a lot like ours, but where Bitcoin will n- never be created. Okay, um, for whatever reason. And the task is to decide which world you'd prefer to live in. That's it. Simple. Simple. Which world would you prefer to live in in that kind of situation? So you don't have to import any like moral theories. You don't have to import any of your own like political views. Uh, definitely not mine. I, I, I'm just saying, here's the framework. Here's the choice. Um, and maybe here's some data. And so here's um, um, first the, the way that I think you should make the choice. And then, then second, we'll supplement 
supplement that um, decision-making framework with some data. So how do we make the choice? So if you're choosing um, which world to actualize and you don't know who you are, um, then the choice involves risk. You don't know you, if you're Pete from Bedford, right. Senator Warren, yeah. or some guy in Bangladesh. Yeah. You could be a prince or you could be a pauper. Yeah. Um, and so when we make decisions like this with risk under uncertainty, uh, most people think that we should consult orthodox decision theory. It's a mathematical framework for how to make decisions like this. And according to this framework, um, you you are supposed to choose the option which maximizes expected utility. And so the idea would be that um, uh, in any choice, um, you uh, there's a there's a probability of an outcome and there's like a value for that outcome, like how good it would be. And then the expected value results mathematically from multiplying the probability by the value. So for example, um, I could um, play the lottery, you know, um, if I win, I, I could get $5 million. But that's a very unlikely outcome. Um, or, I could not play the lottery and save my money. Um, and I think it um, turns out that the decision in this case, which maximizes expected utility for the most part, is to not play the lottery. Because in the vast majority of possibilities, you're just wasting money on the lottery ticket. All right. So this is how orthodox decision theory works. And we can tweak it a little bit so that people can um, import their own kind of... Uh, uh, risk function, which is something like a preference for risk. So you can be risk seeking. So um, you can ride a motorcycle. You, you think the enjoyment of riding a motorcycle um, is worth this extra small chance of dying in a horrible accident, you know? You don't ride a motorcycle. No, no, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's unwise. Yeah. But, you know, um, I think you should not have a risk function that's risk seeking and or at least that risk-seeking. Or it can be risk-averse. Uh, and I'm more risk-averse, and so I would never um, ride a motorcycle. I don't vacation um, in Afghanistan. I don't, you know... Jump out of planes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so everyone can bring their own risk function to the table, their own risk preference. Um, and so this is, a, this is very much like a hand-wavy uh, heuristic. Of, of course... We can't know, like, or um, put a number on uh, the utility or the happiness, you know, on every single person in the world. But, but this is the, this is the idea. This is a hand wavy heuristic um, way of thinking about it. So, like, um, every person has associated it with them a kind of utility, a value. Uh, philosophers often often call them utils. Okay. You know, so like, um, uh, my life is pretty good, you know, so maybe my like overall life utility is like 15 utils. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe Adam Back's life is like really, really good. So he has like 30 utils, you know, so this is, and maybe someone who's like really, you know, um, not well off, um, maybe they're homeless. Um, and they're like really unhappy and desperate. Maybe they have like five utils or something. Like Jeremy over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, um, and so one, one way to make a decision then is, okay, if I'm going to actualize one of these two worlds, I don't know which person I would be in either one of them, then um, what I should do is I, I should average out the utilities in each world and see which one has... Which, which one would give me the most expected utility? And I think that's basically right, as long as we, you know, take account of the person's risk function. And, okay, so that's the framework. And now, so, so now you're behind the veil. You don't know who you are, but you know roughly how to make the decision. You have all this empirical data about, um, you know, what the world would be like if you lived in this world rather than that world. 
and how likely it would be you'd have a good or bad life. All right, so now let's input some data. So suppose, um, well, we know actually that in, that in our world and probably then the very similar world without Bitcoin, that, uh, that there would be a substantial portion of the population that don't have access to a banking account. And this is probably around, according to, I think, data, like 2017 data from the World Bank, it's something like um, one, one tenth to one twelfth of the population who don't have access to a bank account for, for bad reasons. You know, like they distrust banks or they live too far from banks or um, uh, and so on. It's not just that like they don't have enough money. I mean, Bitcoin won't help, help those people. Um, so, so here's the question then, uh, in either of these worlds, you'd have maybe like a one in 12 chance of not having a bank account. Would you rather be in the world without a bank account and then no, having no recourse to anything else? Or would you rather live in the world without a bank account, uh, and have recourse to Bitcoin? Okay. So this is a kind of like, um, financial or economic Russian roulette. Well, th there's no downside on, on, in one world. Well, that's... But the world with, yeah. In this one, the world without... I either have... Uh, go into one world where there's uh, a 1 in 12 chance I don't have a, access to a bank account, yeah. but no upside to that. Right. Whereas the other one, I have a... Yeah. I, own, I, have, the, I have the chance. You have a chance. There's, there's no downside. Yeah. So you might think that there are costs... Um, just associated with having something like Bitcoin. So, for example, um, like in, in the world where there's Bitcoin, there's going to be stuff like ransomware. Okay. Okay. Um, another cost, and which is a real cost, is that um, uh, certain kind of financial intermediaries aren't going to make as much money. Okay. Um, but I think the idea is that... Uh, at least if we just zoom in on this one issue about banking, I think most relatively risk averse people would choose to live in the world with something like Bitcoin. Okay. And then you can just keep going down the line. So um, consider inflation. So like something like, I don't know, one tenth of the, of the world um, lives under uh, runaway inflation. This is terrible. Um, we've kind of gotten a taste of this recently, even um, among us. Um, so, well, I think right now it's going to be way higher than one tenth. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought thought the statistic in your paper was higher. In right. the paper, it was um, one in eight live under double digit inflation. But okay. again, it might have gone up. But I also think the I also thought the number without banking was high. I thought it was like thirty percent. No, that was one in twelve. That was one in twelve. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would have said now. CPI figures, maybe. Yeah. If we say double digit inflation is yeah. the runaway number. Yeah. But I would say those numbers are fake. And I would yeah. say nearly all of the world is now living under double digit inflation. Yeah, that seems right to For me too. World. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. and some people have it worse. You know, yeah. there's a, yeah, there's a spectrum. Digit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, would you rather live in a world with um, inflation or? Would you rather live in a world with inflation, but you have the chance to own uh, an asset with a limited supply, a finite supply, of, like you know, a cap, and uh, and one that's desired, partially for this reason. Um, well, I think I know what I would choose. I would choose the one where I'd have recourse, where I'd have an escape hatch. Um, so that I could put put in store and save some of my money um, for the long term in a way that won't just melt away. And I think that most relatively risk-averse people would choose the same. And so the idea in, in this paper is to um, go through these issues and ask, would you, would you like the Bitcoin world? Or would you like to live in the non-Bitcoin world? And people can bring their own moral theories. They can bring their own political theories um, and values. And they can bring their own risk function to the table. But I do think if most people are suitably informed and honest with themselves, 
I think that they would want to, to have the extra help that Bitcoin offers. So I was listening to a podcast um, not too long ago with Elise Colleen. Yep. And she called Bitcoin fintech for poor people. I'm like, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Um, and I think that's exactly right and why I could make an argument like this. So especially if you're relatively well off in like global terms, going through this kind of thought experiment can help you imagine yourself in someone else's shoes. Because you look at the statistics. And then um, what the framework is helpful for is that it, it doesn't actually tell you what to decide. It just says if you input certain data, it will spit out a certain value about what you should choose. And, uh, and there, there's so much compelling data about how the global poor could be helped by something like Bitcoin that I do think the truth is that Bitcoin is overall good because partially most people would want to live in a world with it because it would help them. So that's fine because they're those binary options. Uh, but I actually also like the bit in there where there's like the risk analysis between who I could be yeah. and who I most likely would be. Yeah, good. So this is where the expected value stuff comes in. So um, there are just many, many more people who aren't wealthy than people that there are. And so um, I, I really do see the choice as a kind of um, economic Russian roulette. And I think that most most people would realize that they would more likely be someone who is not privileged and so they'd like to have recourse in those kinds of situations. And so I, I, I really do think that if you're, you know, a disinterested, honest, genuine outsider, that if you're familiar with this kind of framework, then yeah, you'd say, okay, yeah, I, I guess I don't really have much of a problem with Bitcoin and I can even see why it's a good thing to have around. It's a bit like uh, those who are near the spigot right now. Yes. Don't don't tend to care, or actually probably anti-Bitcoin because it's a threat to them. But if you put them in that scenario where there's a one in 10 chance that you're going to be poor and not have access to banking, uh, there's only a one in much higher number, like a thousand, whatever that number is, to being yeah. close to the spigot, yeah. which one are you going to take? Now, in the reality of the world they're in, mm -hmm. They have no need to care. They're, they're self-interested in staying near the spigot and fuck everyone else. Sure. Um, so I, I see the kind of decision framework or thought experiment, as I've set it up, as a way to build out Alice Gladstein's like check your privilege yeah. slogan. And so what the thought experiment encourages you to do is to leave your privilege at the door. And then you go in behind the veil and then you conduct the equation. <laughs> more or less. Well, and it was really helpful to see that point where you said, <laughs> if you're a wealthy person, not all the time, but you're yeah. generally more likely to want to vote for less tax. And if you're a yes. poor person, you're most likely to want to vote for more welfare. But if you are a poor person who wins the lottery, you suddenly might flip to want to vote for less tax. Yeah. Lotteries provide a nice insight into our self-interest. And the self-interest is strong. It's not just that um, you know, poor people favor policies that favor the poor and wealthy people favor policies that favor the wealthy. It's that even wealthy people, if they had been poor, would have favored policies that favor the poor. And poor people, if they had been rich in that situation, would have favored policies that favor the rich. So, so um, wherever your status goes, your interest follows <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And you want to protect that status. And lotteries are neat because we sometimes see these overnight changes of status. And um, there have been some studies conducted on how this affects people's policy or um, preferences about like tax policies and things. And um, it's not surprising that if you're previously poor 
and you win the lottery and now you're not poor anymore, but extremely wealthy, that all of a sudden you would want to protect that wealth and not to have not have to fritter away in taxes. Also, there is there's another way of looking at these things. Uh, Joe Rogan's been very good at explaining how he grew up poor. Mm. He's obviously now quite wealthy with yeah. his Spotify deal and success in his life. But he always says, look, I remember being poor and we relied on food stamps. It made a big difference to us. And I think that's why he still has that empathetic uh empathetic ideas around welfare and protecting poor people yeah which is and not everyone will do that that's coming a lot from from the joe rogan of bitcoin <laughs> i thought we were the british oh the, yeah the, yeah the, the bbc of bitcoin you can be both at once <laughs> yeah. yeah well i'll take the bbc of bitcoin okay um okay so when you have this framework yeah how do we actually use this because what comes out of this is this moral imperative mm-hmm and there's not only a moral imperative as an individual who is uh, enacting or working on policy that affects millions, tens, if not hundreds of millions of people domestically within your country, but there's this higher moral imperative within the USA whereby if the US bans Bitcoin, it's going to be a lot easier for other countries to ban Bitcoin. Or if the US highly regulated it or was against, did anything to harm Bitcoin, I think that has a trickle down effect to other countries not all we know yeah. el salvador is a yeah doing the same thing but generally speaking it does so there is that trickle down beyond the united states to the real third world developing countries people yeah. who don't have access to technologies and that moral imperative i think is quite important yeah i think so so if if um so i do think bitcoin's an overall good now if if that's true and uh, and I'm right about that, then, yeah, um, banning it would be quite bad. Now, there's um, different kinds of bans. Uh, so so earlier we, we talked about um, what the cypherpunks went through with cryptography, where the government was trying to limit two things, both the strength of the thing and then the spread of the thing. And the government could, so I'm giving away the playbook, but, you know, um, the, the government could do the same thing with Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, the, thing, the things I've heard is they're never going to outright ban it. Yeah. What they're going to do is make it difficult to use. Yes. And so how would they limit the strength of Bitcoin? I think one way to do that would be to um, make it really hard, excuse me, or legal uh, to, to custody it in a self-sovereign way. Mm-hmm. Which uh, they've talked about in Europe. Yeah, so it wouldn't surprise me in places with um, weaker um, protections um, that this would happen. And the the way to limit the spread of Bitcoin, um, I, well, I think the government will have learned its lesson um, in trying to pre- to prevent its spread. I think they. I think they know now that it's um, out of the bag. Like the internet just makes this impossible to, you know, to prevent the spread. And so they would have to um, limit the spread in another way, in a less coercive way. And so I think this is where CBDCs come in. So they would try to offer something that people would want that's maybe even more convenient. Like Britcoin, which yes. Rishi Sunesh in the UK has pushed. And... They've often tricked people into thinking this is very similar to Bitcoin, but the government runs it. Yeah. So it's centralized bullshit. Yeah. 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 And not private. Nope. Um, and you're not self sovereign. Mm. Yeah. So, how do we use this framework? Because there's obviously, you've created it for a reason. Yeah. Me and Danny, in reading this, is really shift our, shifted our own thinking of understanding uh, personal bias skin in the game and decision making yeah how do we how do we as a group of bitcoiners use this to help spread bitcoin <laughs> yeah well i think one, one way to think about it is that this provides a kind of um, intellectual infrastructure to arguments that people already make like alice gladstein and um, that's one way of fulfilling the teaching 
version of the building and teaching like dual um, cypherpunk strategy. And I think um, if, if people see that there's a kind of intellectual infrastructure in this way um, with serious philosophical ideas behind it, then um, they'd be more likely in some cases to listen to Alex Gladstein. And, and that is one of my goals. And so um, I'm not referring to my, myself when I say that there's serious philosophical um, background here to the argument. So the argument is basically, it basically cribs from this political philosopher named John Harsanyi. Um, he, he offered a kind of uh, behind the veil argument about which policies we should adopt. Um, and this is, ex ex this is his framework, mathematical framework. Um, so it's different than the John Rawls framework where um, you, uh, there's, there's all kinds of baggage to the Rawls framework where um, you want to not just maximize expected utility, but you want to make sure that the, you want to choose the option which makes the worst well off the best. So there's like a, it's called like the minimax rule. Um, it has, so this, the Harsanyi version has no such baggage. It's just extremely personal. What's your attitude about risk? You know, input the data that we all have access to. And then um, which world would you like to live in? And so I think if people are curious about, you know, the kind of Gladstein style argument, then, um, or if they find it unconvincing, I think, I think if they find like a mathematical version of it um, or a mathematical model of it, um, they might see, oh, like, actually, this is kind of serious. I think that this is really important more generally for Bitcoin as it matures. Um, we need things that aren't just, we don't, we don't need just things like the Bitcoin Policy Institute. Um, we also need like um, bigger and um, more w or better funded institutions. So I've been reading a lot lately about like how to build or redeem institutions. Um, do you let them collapse and rebuild? Or yeah, you, exactly. Yeah, which is what we're heading towards anyway. It seems so, which is part of Bitcoin's appeal. Um, but I, I, th I think when it comes to universities, well, it's a mixed bag. So um, do universities still do a lot of good? Yeah, of course, especially like physics departments, <laughs> um, computer science departments. Um, could the humanities um, be a net drag on society? Should we defund them? Maybe. You know? Right. Yeah. So you're, it's, but, it's, the, it's the battle of the objective versus the subjective parts yeah, of science. Yeah. And so I think that whether we build new institutions or try to redeem the old ones, we do have to admit that the pe a lot of the people that we're trying to convince this, the currency that they speak in is prestige. Um, and then the kinds of and credentials from institutions that they trust. So one way to build intellectual infrastructure around Bitcoin is to um, do things like build uh, centers devoted to research on Bitcoin. Huh. But and if, if that were to happen, then um, we could build a lot more <laughs> uh, um, intellectual infrastructure. And uh, I think as Bitcoin matures, this is probably inevitable. Well, it's that, happening anyway. Yeah. Um, I think one of the earliest uh, examples was the Nakamoto Institute. Yeah. Yeah. An amazing. Yeah. It's an amazing uh, resource. Yeah, amazing resource. I use it all the time. Yeah. And I, I, I worry it passes a lot of people by who are new to Bitcoin because it's, uh, yeah, Pierre Archard and uh, Michael Goldstein are less. 
visible these days. Yeah. And I think the path to Bitcoin and the tentacles and rabbit holes you can follow may not maybe don't take you to that. Whereas when the yeah. community was smaller, most people would go to that. Yeah. Or a lot of people would go to that. Um, but we do have more resources now. The Bitcoin Policy Institute is one of those. Alex Gladstein and, and his relentless writing, which I don't know how he does. Yeah. Is it? So we have and we also have a wider pool of thinkers. Mm-hmm. A diverse group yeah, of thinkers very as well. Yeah, more than the virulent anti-Bitcoin people would ex- would expect. Also, it makes it challenging for within Bitcoin because the diversity of thinking is producing uh, ideas that conflict with each yes, other with very regards much. to what Bitcoin is and yeah. who it serves and what it's for. I think the original more kind of anarchist thinking is being challenged by people who yeah. aren't anarchists. Yeah, I agree. but but that hap- but conversely, those people come to Bitcoin who aren't anarchists are seeing ideas with regards to anarchism, and and they're learning new things as well. Yeah. So there's like this mesh of ideas. Yes, it, it, that's good. It's, yeah, it's good because um, it's always good to push on people's beliefs to see what gives, and it's good to have um, viewpoint diversity so that um, there there are discussions about what's reasonable to believe and and uh, which values we should hold. And I think that this very much um, ties into uh, an, an early How Finney post. Okay. So um, A lot of those keep coming out recently. Yeah, yeah. There He's, was a, two that I've seen recently where one he talked about very early on about dollar cost averaging. Yeah. That came out the other day. Yeah. I, and there was another one very early on he said, I wonder what Bitcoin mining can do for the environment yeah. or something on the lines. Yeah, and he also has one on NFTs and... Just the foresight yeah. of this guy is just so incredible. Um, but he has this essay, I, I think it's called Politics and Technology. I'm not sure if that's right. Okay. Um, but he says no shortcuts. What's he mean by no shortcuts? It means you actually have to go out and convince people. You can't just like sit in a hut and think that the technology that you built is is inevitably going to take over the world. You actually have to do the hard work of convincing people and getting in front of the public so you can have an effect on the public imagination. And so building is not enough. I don't I don't think it's enough. I think you have to build and teach. Which is coming full circle back to. Yeah. And if you can't build, then certainly teach. Yeah, or do something. Or, <laughs> Hopefully. Or, or present people who can teach to the world. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, um, in all this, you know, you just hope that you're not doing more damage than good. Um, well, I hope but, I haven't. But there's unknowns on that. Uh, yeah. Like one of, the, one of the questions I wanted to put to you is, yeah. how were you able to eliminate your own Bitcoin bias in creating your framework and model? Oh, that's so funny. I <laughs> definitely didn't. You know, um, so I, I, I think, um, can, can I tell you where I, yeah. where, where I, when I questioned it, yeah, was at the end where you got to your criticisms <laughs> yes, and you just, you didn't flesh them out. Yeah. You said there isn't data. And I was like, yeah. huh, I think I could have fleshed yeah. them out. Well, I, I recognize, so I could have fleshed them out more. I also could have come up with more that I, um, I hadn't thought of at the time. And that's another way that our own bias eludes us but but that wasn't so important because yeah. when you worked the framework you only covered banking and inflation inflation you said there are these other ones you didn't need to do them all yeah but i almost wanted to see the reverse oh for sure yeah yeah it's the reverse ones um that i just had in mind that, that um so for example a few minutes ago i mentioned ransomware yeah that's not in the essay and yeah. that's because it just wasn't in front of my mind like i i dismiss like i i myself dismiss it as a relatively unserious concern and so I did so it didn't even come before my mind as something that needed to be addressed but of course if you're anti-bitcoin or on the fence this is one of the things that you'd consider so I don't think that I'm immune to bias and in fact one of my main regrets about the essay is that near the end I used some pretty strong language <laughs> about uh, about um, people who just don't get it uh, and so I, I say that, you know, that, you know, people are like 
are the dumb, the dumb. detached, and the dishonest. Yes, yeah. I wish I wouldn't have reached for the dumb because even after this essay came out, that triggered some people. And I thought that was that's unnecessarily triggering, unnecessarily mm. inflammatory. Yeah. I thought this is going to be your Clint Eastwood movie. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, so when you work in the framework, yeah. you can pick something like banking or inflation. Say, do you want to live in World A or World B? Yeah. Really, do you need everything? You need everything to successfully do it, and that's yeah. why it's impossible. Right. And so you need you need data about not just banking and inflation and all the other things that I mentioned that like I think tend to push us push the needle towards towards being pro bitcoin but all kinds of things that push the needle the other way and so th- these are um what i think of as like the four horsemen of the cryptocalypse you know <laughs> drug dealers kidnappers um child pornographers and terrorists okay all of these groups of people and the people who do you know like ransomware this um and then I think eventually, honestly, um, evading sanctions. Once Bitcoin is big enough, I think in the future, Bitcoin could be used to evade sanctions. But that's, it, that some people see that as a positive because sanctions are well, yes, in, punish the wrong people. E, yeah, so it could be good, it could be bad. Yeah. Um, but is evading sanctions a possibility in the far future? Of course. It's not, it's not impossible. What's, what makes evading sanctions impossible now is that Bitcoin isn't like big enough. But what if, so it's, so when some, like a, a Russian oligarch tries to evade sanctions, he's like trying to put a whale in the bathtub. It's like, well, well there it is, you know? Um, but what, what, what happens when Bitcoin is like the ocean? Well, there are lots of whales in the ocean. And, and so this is another way, there are always going to be trade-offs and, I think we just have to be honest about them. And this is, and we can, I mean, look, I, um, I think the arguments point in favor of Bitcoin. And so I think, and, and but ultimately, I, I, especially as a philosopher, um, I think of myself as like a truth maximalist. That doesn't mm-hmm. mean that I feel like I have a monopoly on the truth, but that's my goal, to just get to the truth. It just so happens that my goal of getting to the truth, in this case, overlaps with what I think Bitcoin is and what it could be and why it's good. And, and so that's why um, I, I do as much as I can to try to uh, sift out this kind of mis and dis, um, disinformation. But if we're, if, if we're doing this and we're being honest, we can gain credibility with disinterested parties about mentioning you know, some of the possibly negative consequences that Bitcoin might have in the future. Like you mentioned earlier, these like, you know, unknown second and third order effects. Mm. And I worry about that too. Well, I want to talk about that, but I just yeah. wanted to finish on one, one point is what, yeah. what I took from the model. Uh-huh. I didn't take from it that everyone should uh, go behind the veil and, and yeah. uh, run through the model and make their decision. What yeah. I took from it is that it helped me understand uh, how different people make decisions and the influence on them. It, I see. It, it, so it, it's not just that there's the, there's the social layer and there's the economic layer yeah. for why people make decisions. And yeah. look, I know Elizabeth Warren is a fucking moron, yeah. and I know she probably doesn't understand what she's talking about. People are telling her what to say. Mm-hmm. She's politically motivated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I know a lot of uh, politicians are probably power-motivated, I also know a lot of people, rich people and bankers who probably economically, I know all that exists. Mm-hmm. But but to be able to give a reason why that exists yeah. in terms of their decision making is helpful. And also, yeah. it was really helpful for me to then look at myself. And it made me want to spend more time on these negatives and actually say, we should we need to talk about this a bit more. Yeah. I've always felt like, we're in this place right now where, you know, I still think the world is relatively a safe place compared to history. Yeah. We're in economic unstable times, though, which which is dangerous. Mm-hmm. We see this future world, some number of decades, whatever, down the line, where it could be a Bitcoin world, and we believe that will be a better world. Yeah. 
But the journey from one to the other could be fucking horrendous. It could be bloody, dangerous. Sure. Everything, <clears throat> you know, there's a complete shift in how money works, how things are priced. That could have all these unknown effects and they make me nervous. Yeah. And I, I think it's really valuable to work on Bitcoin's trade offs with a focus on its potential negative consequences. Because if you do, you can address them. I mean, this is one reason yeah. wh why I respect um, Bitcoin developers so much. They have this kind of adversarial mindset. Like, how could this be attacked? What are the weaknesses? So, so a, a goal of someone is to find a bug. And, and what is that? That's looking for something negative in something. Um, and I think we should do the same with, with the potential social consequences, social and economic consequences of Bitcoin, we can only benefit from just uncovering the truth. Um, I, don't, there's, I don't think there's much value in just being like Bitcoin partisans yeah. and like just trying to win um, for winning's sake and to pump our bags, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, look, I am convinced Bitcoin is better for the world. Yeah. But I don't know if, depends on everyone's measurement, but I don't know if it, ends up taking us to a net better or net worse place. Yeah. I think it takes us to a net better place. That's yeah. why I support it. But if it doesn't, I've I've played this little small role in yeah. in taking us to that this worse place. Yeah. So it's really important for me if as we go on this journey to at least understand the potential and what that means. Some people are more anarchists and they believe uh, the government is bad at redistributing money and don't I think tax is theft and mm -hmm. think uh, all government is evil. I'm more of a supporter of democracy, uh, would like much smaller government, mm -hmm. but I don't mind paying tax. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that there are programs in place to help people who are worse off. And having traveled to the world from the relative safety of the UK to places which are dysfunctional, and seeing people crack through the system in two different places, mm -hmm. I'm glad I live in a place where we have protections in place. And yeah. I respect other people's opinions. Yeah. In a Bitcoin world, that might break down. And I don't I don't know if that takes us to a place where, because we're paying less tax and we've eroded the state, we are more generous and help others, or it takes us to a place where we're more selfish. We don't give a fuck and there are people who, cr who have fallen between the system. There's no protection and that leads to higher crime. Like, I don't know. Yeah, so the, there are the, like path-dependent con contingencies. Yeah. And it's um, impossible to know beforehand. And we can just, we, we can only do the best we can with the limited information we have and the limited brain power we have. Um, so, so first, um, let me try to make you feel better. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, so. I don't feel too bad. Okay, good. I mean, so so this kind of world you're talking about is a hyper Bitcoinized world. Yes, right. Uh, I I still lean towards thinking that this is unlikely. Oh, it's unlikely to happen. I think it's unlikely to happen in our lifetimes. Okay, you know, am I saying determinately no? Like, can you like dunk on me and you know you know timestamp my saying this? Um, and then show me I'm wrong in 10 years. Okay, I mean, fine. You yeah. know, it's, it's just a probabilistic judgment. Yeah. So I think that hyper Bitcoinization is unlikely. By the way, just as you go in there, yeah. do you find the timestamps of opinions on Twitter a, a, a virtue signal against sometimes. and a slightly coercive? In, in yeah, like, yeah, oh, sometimes. In that, fuck, if, I hold, if I'm trying to express a controversial opinion, I'm going to get timestamped. Yeah. And that person, the, the timestamp in itself is them saying, you're a fucking idiot. Why did <laughs> yeah. you write that? I'm going to embarrass you in two years. Yeah, yeah. fuck you, you idiot. Yeah. And then you're like, shit, I might not do that again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've never, I've never done the tweet stamp thing, I think. Um, partly, partly just because I'm afraid that once I do it, I will have picked the one that doesn't work. You know, but um, like I got a defunct I, one or something. I got tweet stamped by Gigi this week for saying oh, I don't yeah. think Monero is a scam. So, yeah. And I so I tweet stamped his tweet stamp, and then I retweeted <laughs> his go. tweet stamp because I was like, "Fuck yeah. this." Agree and amplify. Yeah, the winning move. So um, it's okay to be wrong. It's uh, well, first it's okay to be wrong, and also we're going to have different, you know, probability assessments about the future, and it's okay to disagree about that. Um, so, like, I think that. Well, first, I agree with you. Monero is not a scam. 
Okay. Okay. Um, I think that there are lots of scams, but not everything is a scam. And I yeah. think we lose credibility when we call everything a scam. It's like the boy crying wolf yeah. kind of situation. But um, in addition, I think that it's more likely than not that we're going to have fiat currencies for a very long time. Um, when, when I talk to a, even Bitcoin friendly economists, um, they they think that hyper Bitcoinization is so unlikely because of the dollar's network effects. I think they have a major point. We we tout network effects all the time uh -huh. in order to argue for Bitcoin against these other um, uh, cryptocurrencies and crypto assets. And I think that's that's a compelling argument. Network effects matter. So why wouldn't it matter for the dollar too? People want the dollar. I mean, people. I, I think it's network effects and network threats are two things that have. Sure, that's true. Um, interesting conversation we had with Preston Pish the other day. He said the two currencies that are going to matter are Bitcoin and the dollar. So the yeah. two yes. will have this probably symbiotic network effect. I agree. Symbiotic. You have, you have um, spending and saving. Yeah. And so you, it's like a, the... Future, it'll be like the future version of checking and savings. Yeah. I think very much so. People want stable coins. I mean, I don't think we should tell uh, poor people to put everything into Bitcoin. I literally tweeted about this the other day. I Did said you? it's completely irresponsible. It's irresponsible. Bit, yeah. Bitcoin does not solve. And, and it's, yeah. it, it's this thing where I, it goes back to Glassteam, where yeah. I felt uh, challenged by calling platforms shit coins and being against them. And Alex, explaining the importance of stable coins in certain jurisdictions. It's like, yeah. oh, how do we square that circle? I think yeah. the platform's junk, right? especially something like Tron. At the same time, that's a very important platform with people in certain parts of, know, of like Africa or yeah. you know, who want tethers. Or, and you know, there were people, uh, Bitcoiners from Venezuela and Argentina saying, yes, this is important. There are... Bitcoiner, certain Bitcoiners going, no, we should, we should just teach this. Yeah. And that's an instance where they themselves aren't listening to um, the global poor. They're not, you know, I, ha I hate the check your privilege yeah. thing when it's um, applied in like, like more woke circumstances, like in academia. I'm fine with it when Alex says it, but um the same, the very same same thing applies to Bitcoiners who are um, strongly anti stablecoin. Clearly, there's a use for it. Clearly, people want it. Clearly, it's good because of Bitcoin's volatility. Um, maybe someday Bitcoin will be less volatile. Uh, I don't think. I think Bitcoin will always always be somewhat volatile. So the volatile. So the, there will always be a use case for a less volatile monetary asset, and which. Which asset has the best network effects? That's the U.S. dollar, and if that's right, then you're going to have this exactly symbiotic relationship between the dollar and Bitcoin. It just seems so. It, it makes so much sense to me. We have a we have an internal meme for uh, those people who don't, haven't been able to put themselves in the shoes of other people. We yeah. we refer to the Swedish libertarian. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> uh, I think there's going to be a clash between the zealots and the philosophers. They, yeah. They're going to burn you at the stake for well, challenging the... They've already come at Troy pretty strongly of course. Um, for his ideas about um, Bitcoin's energy, energy consumption. Yeah. And it won't surprise me if um, they come after me and... Um, Call me a, a statist or a, a fan of cuck bucks or you know, a scammer or something, um, but uh, that's okay. I mean, um, they come after me all the fucking time. Yeah. Right? So and, and also, um, it's just I, a little bit ironic that they would do that against the best interests of Bitcoin. So it's not even productive for them to do this. It's counterproductive. Uh, I, I from our previous interview, I have a challenge to the anarchists with yeah. regards to energy. Uh -huh. In that, uh, if you if you are if you don't want a state, you can't have an energy grid because an energy grid has yeah. to be a monopoly. 
yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, um, I think, that, but could, I think there's lots of examples of that. There's lots of examples. I mean, this is why um, I could never be a libertarian, libertarian or an anarchist. I mean, as soon as you get rid of the state, you're going to need all the kinds of things that you just got rid of. Yeah, and you're going to have to like crowdfund for them. And you have to have people in charge of them. Yeah, roads. Oh, don't start with the roads. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so, well, okay, well, let's take donations yeah. for vehicular pathways. Okay, now we have taxes and roads. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually think. Uh, oh God, I'm probably boring myself to the saying this. I I agree with the libertarians on so much. I just think there needs to be more of a political wing for libertarians. Imagine there was a third party in the US, which was the Libertarian sure. Party. That was the kind of like escape valve for people who didn't yeah. felt trapped. And then they had some political clout, some of their ideas about a smaller state. Yeah. You know, separation of money, like financial sure. governance. That would be useful. Yeah. But what so we, useful. we just have left to right in a, a organism that just grows and rent seeks and takes more from everyone else. Right. But we've had something that pulled down on that. Yeah. I think that would be fucking, I'd vote for that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, so um, one of my favorite philosophers is a um, 17th, 17th century philosopher named Gottfried Leibniz. He created or discovered calculus. And okay. It's amazing. Like a once in a millennium sort of mind. And he had um, some strange views. Uh, so he, he thought that everything is ultimately mental. Um, so basically that we kind of live in the matrix. Um, but if you unplug, there's, it's just like souls, you know, there's no like further physical reality that's, um, creating the matrix. It's just like, this is all, um, all mental. Like, like what's this, you know, what's this can? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's this particular shape and size and colors. And these are all like mental experiences and you peel them all away. There's nothing there. Um, but this is, these are the kind of views that he wasn't interested in sharing with everyone. He was, um, but he, he did want to convince people. So what he would do is he would say, okay, where, where is this person on the like philosophical spectrum? How do I get them to take one step towards me? They don't even know, have to know fully what I believe. I just wanted them to take one more step. And so I think if we had, um, so this applies in two ways, both, both to our contemporary politics and towards, um, you know, the more um, maxi, you can, you can be a more, you can make something more appealing and you can push people to the truth as you see it in small ways. And that's more effective. Um, and I think that this uh, this kind of uh, movement towards moderation would be a very good thing. And so, like for like a political party, you could um, note where the left and right are, and you could just inch a little bit closer <laughs> towards the middle um, for each issue. You don't have to go full hog libertarian. You know, you mm. can just, I think that would draw a lot of people. And I also think that if Bitcoiners discussed Bitcoin in this way, um, asking questions. Oh, really? And then just kind of nudge the counter just a little bit each time. I think that would be more effective. Well, I think one of the problems with politics is uh, there is a picking of a side, especially here yeah. in the US. Yeah. And there's the belief that, oh, I need the this party to win because they share my same beliefs on XYZ. And yeah. it's like, no, I need these to win because they share my beliefs on XYZ. Yeah. Uh, what I think a lot of the voters haven't realized is the collective destruction that happens. It doesn't matter which party he's in. So, yeah. for example, yeah. runaway inflation is caused yep. by both parties. Absolutely. Um, and I think if people understood the real issues, then maybe they would realize some of the, it, they're not seeing the issues that nobody's talking about because they benefit both parties. But if you yeah. had a libertarian party, so we have a left to right pull mm-hmm. from conservatism to. Uh, progressive ideas, and, and that's been good. You know, you don't want to go f- too progressive, you don't want to go too conservative. We don't have the big, big, small mm-hmm. drag. We just have the big, big, and bigger. Yeah. And big, big, bigger in government is, is ultimately destructive for productivity and in- individuals. And yeah, I think yeah. that would be good. I agree with that. I agree that would be good. Okay. Yeah, very much so. Uh, is there anything I want to ask you about that you would have wanted to cover as part of this? 
Um, you know, not so much. Uh, I, I'm doing the best I can. So if anyone has like objections, you know, feel free to fill up my, uh, my DMs. Um, People will be in touch. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but uh, I'm doing the best I can, and uh, it's a good faith effort. Um, so if I made mistakes or you think I'm wrong, just let me know, and I'll um, maybe I maybe you'll change my mind. Um, but I, um, I really hope that we can we can build up Bitcoin's intellectual infrastructure. Mm-hmm. You know, either by um, continuing the work at BPI, um, Bitcoin Policy Institute, or um, building something like a research center. I think that would be uh, really cool. Um, and uh, the the philosophy professors, most of our work is at uh, resistance.money, and I, I would be interested what people think about it. Yeah, well, listen, keep doing this. I think the, yeah. uh, uh, the rise of this new wave of Bitcoin philosophy, I don't want to say Bitcoin philosophers uh, on its own because some people say, well, we've had this before, but th- this new wave yourself, Troy, and various other people are coming in thinking about Bitcoin in different ways, I think super useful. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin is, everyone is aware of it. It's becoming part of both culture and the economy and people's daily lives. It's uh, being adopted by people from the left, from the right, from moderates, libertarians. It's it's everywhere. And, yeah. and the consequences of that, we don't know. Mm-hmm. But I think it's useful to have a broader and more open debate regarding Bitcoin and what it means. So I absolutely welcome you. I think you're fucking amazing. Keep doing it. Um, you have a welcome uh, permanent invite on the show. If you have a new paper and you're okay. like, oh, Pete, I want to discuss this, you just give me a shout and, and we will cover that in the future. But keep doing your thing and I really appreciate having your time today. You're very kind, Peter. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been listening to you for years <laughs> as I wash dishes. So it's uh, a bit unreal to be here. And um, yeah, I hope to see you again before not too long. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter.